Malcolm introduced aviation into high schools and in 79 into Kent Street <coughs> High School and um, introduced um, aviation to WA universities in 1993 to Edith Cowan University and he's now retired. If you'd step forward please, St. Mary. Bob, neither of the Bryans can get my name right, it's Yo. Oh, so Bob gave me what the Bryans told him. <laughs> and for those who can't understand my lack of slanty eyes, Yo is actually originally French, it was um, spelled Y apostrophe, no, J apostrophe E A U. And my mob came across the channel back in 1066, and we won. <laughs> and it, it meant, the Y apostrophe E A U meant by the water, as everyone knows. He knows French, knows that. And um, we took over Somerset, Devon area of England. Did you say you were sorry? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I, 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 my luck came out to Australia in 1830 something, so, um, so I do apologise for that. My heritage is British, but then again, it's not Chinese. Okay, um, why am I talking about this? Um, I asked that as well. I got a, a message when I was in Kiwiland a couple of weeks ago from Brian to say, will you give us a talk on Cabochon? Uh, I can't remember <coughs> why. I know it was an interest of his because he uh, was involved with the, the sporting car club, which um, used the aerodrome probably more than anyone else. Um, and um, it's possible that at one stage I did say to him, while I was at university, I had uh, students do a number of assignments on West Australian aviation history, and I probably mentioned Cavisham, and he thought, well, that'll be as boring as all shit, but I'm, I'll be away in Oshkosh, so I'll put it on everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving right along. If you've got a road map, that's what uh, the Cavisham area looks like. A um, couple of features there's Whiteman Park there, and there's Yuldeen road there. Down the bottom here, not on the map, is uh, Marshall Road. So why is that of interest? Well, hang on, they'll get another mention somewhere along the track and you'll see why. I'm not sure that it explains it, but you can see why I put it there. So if that was your, your road map, you could in fact overlay it with that, which is the actual picture of the Cavisham airstrip. It wasn't originally Cavisham Airstrip, but we'll come to that. That's what it's become known as, and it's got a, uh, an NDB there, which announces itself as CVM. Uh, so I guess that's another reason. But when it actually changed its name, no one seems to know. Or at least none of my good students who provided me with all their essays ever told me why it, when it, why it had changed its name. But uh, many of you will have seen it. Um, Pilots approaching on uh, runway 21, uh, sorry, 03, um, unless you're approaching backwards. And um, you, you would probably have noticed, taking off, you might have even noticed it as well. So that's uh, Cavisham. It uh, was originally set up as part of uh, the RAAF's uh, move to make satellite fields. Um, Japan had come into the war and were worrying Australia because they were busy on a bombing program up in the north and uh, Pierce at that stage didn't have any satellites so uh, they put up Muliabini to the north and Jinjin to the north uh, west and um, Bindoon of course sort of slightly to the northeast and Beverly and uh, they also included another strip uh, which was at West Swan and that was taken over was uh, became a fleet air arm base at West Swan. Now, Australia didn't have any carriers, England did, and it was set up for the POMs. They were going to uh, unload some of their aircraft onto uh, this, these two strips, Cavisham and Muliabini, uh, before they actually uh, arrived in port, and the port, interesting enough, into which they were going to arrive, was not the one full of submarines, prenatal, but it was Coburn Sound, so I'm not quite sure where they intended to park there. Perhaps it was just park and come ashore. Uh, the only time that uh, I ever saw that 
happen, and it did happen in later years, was in the 1970s, I think the carrier was Ark Royal, but I can stand corrected there. Uh, they put uh, ashore some uh, sea vixens and some sea, oh, I don't know what else came ashore at the time, but it was sea vixens that, were, that made the name uh, Pierce, because Pierce had just put up a new barrier at the end of the strip to uh, catch any errant Mackies that had um, either bad pilots or brake failure or both. Um, and uh, the first to use it was a sea vixen, which landed, you know how short they can land, well it used all 6,000 feet, uh, and went through the barrier and converted the barrier into these little bits of rope that you could use for washing lines, um, and flattened the sides of the vixen, which were firstly round and then they got flattened in as the nose went through. So it's something that could have been done back then, um, but uh, the Poms requested that, sorry, the, uh, the British requested that uh, it be a, um, a medium bomber um, field, uh, B-25, B-26 size, which I, I don't know, and some, someone will tell me later, particularly people who uh, knew a bit about the Royal Navy, what sort of bombers that they would have had uh, of that size, which are operating off aircraft carriers. So we won't repeat it now. So, out came this uh, uh, survey, first of all, for these fields. This one was actually at, at Pierce, uh, sorry, at Perth. And uh, I was amazed by the um, classification, that's over-classification I've ever, ever seen anything. It was uh, over a year, which direction is the wind blowing? Uh, if you can't read it at the bottom, it said uh, anywhere between north and south. This was simply so they could establish runways north south 23% of the time, north east south west 33% of the time, east west 25% of the time, north west south east 17% of the time, and calm 2% of the time. That certainly bears out uh, Perth's um, characteristic as the, um, the second windiest city in the world in terms of how long per each day the wind is actually blowing. Uh, it's calm 2% of the time. So it's not a new thing, obviously, because this was done back in 1942. Now, Pierce had, uh, sorry, not uh, Pierce, but the West Australian Coastal Plain and uh, associated with Pierce had some interesting things. Pierce was up here, as you know, um, Middle Swan, which was later called Cavisham, was there. The Guildford Airport, which was Dunreath, was there. It wasn't even Perth Airport at that stage. And of course, Maylands was here. Now, what, why I bothered with this one, well, I've coloured this. this it was out of a, um, something from the archives, and it was all black and white. Um, but it was boring enough then, it was boring enough now, but it was even more boring when it was just black and white. But why I wanted to show it to you is uh, to show you the runways, for example, which interested me, it appears. There's an east-west, which I think is that, that's the one on which the tower was placed back in the 60s or 70s when the new tower was put in. Um, there's the um, uh, southwest, northeast, which is still there. Uh, and then there was another one, which I think seems to match the direction of the, uh, the flight line and, and the carports at, um, at piers. Certainly, the runways that are currently in use, runway 3-6, uh, isn't there at all, so I don't know when that turned up. There was an upper swan listed on this uh, secret document too, and uh, it's been declassified, don't worry. Um, and now I didn't know that ever existed and I took a fair amount of interest. Can anyone tell me whether that was a proposed strip or whether there actually was an upper swan strip? No? Good. Oh. Down. Uh, no, not Lord Street. That's the one we're talking about now. That's Middle Swan. Uh, now this one would have to. That's where the Swan River turned off. So, and this is um, Jane Brook. So it had to be somewhere in there, according to this map. But I don't know whether it was a proposal or whether it was actually there. But someone who flew in that era may know. Still there. Still there, is it? Yeah. Well, there you go. Thanks, Ted. And Ted will give you a lecture on um, up Swan <laughs> next time. <laughs> Um, okay, the, so there was Middle Swan, uh, Guildford of course as you know was uh, Dunreath, uh, golf course to start with, it's got only, only one runway there is existing now, that's 0624, 
And um, the other runway, of course, has been decommissioned, runway 111. Um, and it's now major taxiway. And of course, the main runway, um, which um, was variously 02 and then 03, the problem being that if it was 02, it was 20 at the other end. And someone decided back in um, the 70s or early 80s that pilots were prone to being stupid. So someone at an international airport, being directed in by a control tower, would possibly pick the wrong runway, 02 for 20. And so that was the reason they didn't change the direction of the runway, they just changed the numbers. So it became 03. <laughs> 0321. But they haven't shifted it yet, it's still the same area there. By the way, uh, Guildford Airport is interesting, and this is just an aside to Cavisham because that's not. Um, Guildford is in the shires of uh, Calamunda and Belmont, and it's in the postal area of Cloverdale. The reason it was called Guildford Airport was because it was put there in, um, in, during the war, and the only people going to it at that stage were golfers who hadn't realised that it was now an airfield and um, service personnel. And the closest railway station for them was Guildford. So there you are. There's a bit of trivia that you can shock people with at your next dinner party. OK, there was a requirement then for an acquisition of land in order to fulfil this requirement for the fleet air arm. And uh, they took that large lump of land there. Now, you can see that it's rather large compared with what they were going to use in terms of runways. And um, it took them a few months and then they broke it down to the right dimension or better dimensions. Now you can see they're pretty much to the same scale and you can see by how much in the red markings there they reduced it. This stopped upsetting so many farmers uh, but uh, it still uh, was, was fairly large for that area particularly as they never used it. So that was the, the, the arrangements of which they were working. And in between those two drawings, they'd gone from four runways down to three. Um, no one found out any information for me at the time as to why that decision was made, but there you are. Uh, there's some notable names there of people who were the owners, the dispossessed owners at the time. Um, Whiteman, and uh, of course you now know Whiteman Park, Marshall. Um, and um, the others I don't know, but then the other thing I couldn't do, the, the document I was trying to photocopy was far too large for my photocopier, so <laughs> there are a few other names around there which appear. How quickly did they get into it? Well, uh, runway 1836 was built between uh, February and August 1943. That's not bad. There were two stages in a runway. You had to, um, had to seal, you had to uh, put down limestone and, and uh, gravel and, um, and, and pretty much cement it into position. And then the second stage was to seal it. Um, so that was completely done between February and August. Concurrently, they built runway 1331 between March and July the same year. And um, 0523 was by September, had also been built to stage one, hadn't been sealed. Then in June, 43, a fleet air arm ordered taxiways and um, dispersal areas for their bombers and, and uh, the windsocks were also asked for. I thought that was rather surprising. You'd have to ask these to be retrofitted to an airfield. But there you go. This is the, this is the um, document which has also now been declassified. And uh, in that they talk about uh, how to how the runways should be built according to these specifications put forward by the Fleet Air Arm. And uh, they had hideouts and hideout taxiways. These dispersal points were called hideouts. Further down, they also uh, put in other requirements that they wanted. So, in the first instance, we had, uh, in looking at a segment of it, these were the two runways. And then they had these machine gun, oh sorry, they then put in the, the dispersal taxiway, as you see, coming around through the bush. And then the uh, provision of machine gun posts, which are all the red ones, 
and then mm. the dispersal points for the aircraft all the way around. So it looked like they intended to put a whole lot of carriers in here at once. Um, and I doubt they could carry that number of bombers. But there you go. I suppose there were all sorts of good reasons. A later document that uh, the RAF provided um, indicated they'd also added all of those to the south, uh, which continued right down towards Marshall Road. <coughs> Then on the 15th of December 1943, having raced, raced in from February and put all this together, a curtailment order was issued to the Main Roads Department who were building this uh, for all fleet air arm aerodromes, all two of them. Um, however, they did indicate that further work would have to be done in order to um, gravel the taxiways and the dispersal points and uh, finish the priming of runway 05. So that's the story of Cavisham as a, um, an airfield in wartime. And that's its total wartime history. It was built. So what happened? Well, the military had a patch of ground, which I might say they still have, which had been um, uh, resumed in the name of uh, the Commonwealth. There was a campsite on the field, which right through, and some of those people who frequented this place in the 50s and 60s could probably tell me all about it. But this camp to this campsite was used by the citizen military forces and I suspect the uh, national servicemen. Um, and uh, there was a comment made there which one of the students picked up that um, uh, the army tended to lie around all day doing not much at all. So I thought, yeah, that's, um, those are all sergeants <laughs> or drill instructors. Um, the airspace over the field was uh, allowed to be used by the RAAF, or was used by the RAAF, I mean, certainly could allow it, it was close enough to pierce for them just to be off the end of the runway, uh, for aerobatic training, and there was an indication that it could have been used for forced landing practice, and uh, since then I have been told that in fact it was, because people have, from in this room today have actually carried out forced landings there. Um, at the time, the aircraft in which they were doing their forced landings mainly was the Tiger Moth, uh, practice force landing, so I hasten to add. Uh, and of course, the military still used it for the RAAF and Army communications that were set up there in the 70s and continue on. So it then went to civilian use, and the main people using it were the Gliding Club of Western Australia, uh, West Australian Sporting Car Club, the Department of Civil Aviation, and the West Australian Police Force. Now, I did say West Australian Gliding Club, but it wasn't the actual Gliding Club of West Australia, it was full name. At that stage, it was called the Perth Gliding Club. And in fact, it had been displaced from over at the old Subiaco Aerodrome, uh, where they weren't uh, wanted because uh, they tore up the, uh, the um, strip there. When I say they, the, the military ordered that the uh, Subiaco Aerodrome be destroyed. And, uh, and as you uh, are well aware of that, if you were here when I actually gave a session on the Subiaco Aerodrome, um, I was the last person to use it <laughs> about 26 years later, and instead of destroying the field, they've destroyed the aircraft. But at that stage, it was a playing field. Um, the first <coughs> open day was held out in Cavisham uh, on the 26th of March 1946. Uh, the only 2C glider which the club had was destroyed in a heavy landing, so the club was left with a one a one-seat glider for the next few years and uh, before they got another one I think uh, 1949 uh, to go with it and they didn't have any training gliders. Perth Gliding Club became the Gliding Club of Western Australia around about that time. They built a hangar on the base in 1950 and they were given a three-year site lease in 1951. Uh, the first aero tow, they were using auto tows, using vehicles, um, first aero tow was conducted um, according to the research that I had by Ray Baird using a Tiger Moth in September 1951. I uh, actually had the registration of that somewhere but um, not with me. They were uh, granted a 15 year lease in 1956 um, but then there was a problem and it was um, Perth Airport. Um, Ray Baird said he used to get airborne and be looking straight down uh, the uh, runway 02 at that stage and um, uh, so it wasn't really surprising that the people who were flying out of Perth Airport were getting a bit edgy. Um, the Department of Civil Aviation actually offered them Cunderdon. At first they didn't want to shift and then they decided it was a very good idea. 
And uh, so they shifted to Cundit in the 19th of November, well, sorry, the last flight out of Caversham occurred at the end of 1958. Now, what about all these landowners? Um, the land had all been requisitioned from the owners and there were all odd shapes because of the way in which they then cut it up for Caversham. There were all these odd shapes to return, so they didn't do either. They just paid out, uh, continued to pay out uh, money, but because the people who were grazing animals and so on <coughs> didn't really, weren't really impressed at all. So that's um, Yuldeen Roads, named after Jack Yuldeen, who uh, must have been a very lowly um, servant of the Commonwealth because he was uh, given the job of sorting out this amongst all the parties and all the governmental departed parties. He was there for 25 years and never sorted it out. <laughs> but, um, and he was possibly there for longer, but the records to which we had access ran out. Um, but his uh, main uh, problems were particularly this AE Marshal, then he died in an LD Marshal, his son took over the business and um, they were very upset about the fact that they weren't getting um, their land back. They were two of the largest claimants. And of course, uh, there, there is something, I suppose, of compensation, as I mentioned on the map before they, all of those people get mentioned. <laughs> Sporting Car Club, I know some people here are involved with that. Um, the boots that are possibly relevant or irrelevant, depending on your point of view, was a chap called Clem Dyer in 1946. Took his, Aust his Morris 8 around the airfield, borrowed the the military gave him the key to get in and he declared it to be fit for a racetrack. Um, so a Victory Grand Prix was held and it was held as the first post-war race in Australia and the winner was Clem Dyer in his Dyer Special. I suppose the rest of them were in Dyer Straits. <laughs> um, the, the main way of being able to get this Grand Prix going was for it to be for, for some purpose and the purpose we, was to... Um, um, Set, give money to the RSL and the Civilian Maimed and Limbless Association and 60,000 people turned up um, and that's probably because it was the only big event just after the war that people could go out and have a look at. This race track for the Victory Grand Prix, you will see it on the main map later, but this is turned around, that's really the north-south strip that you're looking at running across the top and that's the main straight. And um, this particular map was drawn up by Clem Dyer himself, it turned up in the records and so I was able to uh, mm -hmm. photocopy the bits that would fit on the screen. The West Australian Sporting Car Club also gained a lease in uh, 1953 which they maintained until 1968 and uh, they built all of those things there, they built the pits, they built the um, race headquarters, the PA and uh, spectator fencing and uh, they also put in permanent toilets, which was always important. And they maintained the runway and the track, and that's, that was good because it meant that the people who um, should have been maintaining it, the military didn't have to. Uh, they conducted the Australian Grand Prix there in 1957, and again in 1962. And in 1957, um, these shots from there was Sidney Anderson, who was a, a name in cars around Perth when I was a lad. Um, many of you may have known him already um, yeah. when you were grown men. The only reason I come along here is because it makes me feel young. <laughs> um, and Jack Brabham, uh, I think he actually won that Grand Prix, but maybe not. Certainly that, that was the photograph of him uh, at Caversham in 1957. Um, the Grand Prix in 1957 was, uh, they held a public race between a tiger moth and a racing car. And the Tiger Moth eventually had to take off because um, it, it was, uh, you couldn't hold it on the ground any longer. But I had a bit of a worry about this. I mean, if you can't beat a Tiger Moth and you've got a racing car, um, <laughs> Western Australia is a bit of a backwater, isn't it? Um, either that, well, no, either that or nothing. Might have been a cyclone pushing him. Um, racing was ceased at Cavisham after the army decided they were going to use Cavisham as a transceiver site in 1968, so those big antennae went up and so they moved to the dedicated track which they uh, built and um, managed, I understand, out at Wanneroo, which is currently now under review. In, 19, uh, in 2007, um, Brian got, to, I don't know whether Brian got this lot together, but he gave me the photograph of uh, 
some of the cars that were in the Grand Prix in 1957. And I can actually even see a Maserati in there, which I remember seeing when I was a real child down at Narrage and racing around the, the town, um, around, around the houses. That's right, gee, you're older than I am. <laughs> okay, so um, that's the area, and if you'd, um, if you'd been out there, that's the track you would have been using. Um, the early racing involved three run runways there, and um, so that you didn't have to go off on that uh, area around the outside but obviously it was fairly boring and that last corner coming into the straight would have been an interesting one for those cars then the west australian police force in october 1956 just fearing that the hoon laws were coming in stopped um, doing their speedometer tests and other things in bull creek road down here and um, and asked for permission to use caversham um, that was promptly granted in the space of about a month and all aspects of the police advanced driver training have been conducted there ever since. And they apparently used four-wheel drive vehicles to go through the bush and um, skid pans and all that sort of thing. Um, it was also, as um, people have reminded me today, the airspace over Caversham uh, was a, a DCO training area, area, mainly from aircraft, maybe exclusively for aircraft coming out of Maylands. And um, at the, the DCA also set up uh, an, an NDB there in the 70s as a component of the um, instrument approach to Perth. Um, if you're going to have Aero Club aircraft um, training uh, over an aerodrome, sometimes, or in any training area, sometimes you get this happen. Um, yes, it was an Aero Club aircraft. And um, I, I don't know, but someone here probably does. The pilot wasn't killed. Does anyone remember who it was? Not that one. No, no, no. Uh, okay. Uh, and I was told that the registration was ARM, but from what I can see there, it looks like something MR. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You really don't know. I was just hoping one of the <coughs> one of the people who's been around longer might have recognised that either they did it or perhaps they did, and that's why they're not saying. <laughs> But there was plenty of room in the rear cockpit after the arrival. So that's it. That's Cavisham, the airfield that achieved none of its objectives for which it was built. Thanks. Yeah.